Mike McIntyre made a big impact. We're talking about 10 wins this past season. A massive improvement. In fact, that 10 wins, just as many as what he had the first three years combined. Add that to a Pac-12 South Championship, an offense that was fun to watch, and a defense that, other than the final two games of the season, had an impact, a big impact, which we'll talk about later. Before I break down the offense, did you know that the Buffaloes' 10 wins last season, all 10, they rushed for over 100 yards. But in their four losses, they did not hit the 100-yard rushing plateau. Look, we can talk about how big the quarterback's going to have to be. We'll talk about Steven Montez later. We can talk about the receivers and how loaded they are. We'll talk about them later, too. But if the ground game is not consistent, if they don't get on track, then you can kind of see where that theme is going. They're not going to win. Philip Lindsay is a big reason why Colorado had a successful 2016. He's back for his senior year. Five yards per carry is what he averaged, over 1,200 yards on the season on the ground, and 16 touchdowns. When Colorado got into the uh, red zone, um, he was money. That's where he scored most of his TDs, and he's a threat catching the ball out of the backfield. Most of the offensive down linemen returned for CU, and that includes the talented left tackle, the veteran, that's Jeremy Irwin, now entering his senior year. Now, the lineman I think has got the most upside for the Buffs is uh, Tim Lynette. Now, Lynette, a sophomore, they're probably going to move him from guard to center. That's the one position at center where the Buffs do not return a starter as far as the down lineman goes. So don't be surprised if uh, Lynette plays at center for Colorado. Now, let's talk about the receivers. And there's no question the most talented bunch of receivers in the Pac-12. And Shea Fields, he's your home run threat. Nearly 900 yards receiving, very reliable receiver. But also, too, don't forget about uh, Devin Ross, who had nearly 800 yards of receiving yardage. Bryce Bobo, nearly 550 yards, and Jay McIntyre, that's right, the coach's son, a little over 400 yards receiving. So plenty of depth, plenty of reliability, and plenty of targets for Steven Montez to throw to. He now replaces um, Sefo Lufau, who was a four-year starter for the Buffaloes. And by the way, CU's all-time passing leader, and he was a threat to run the ball as well. And uh, one good thing, though, about Montez, he did get a little bit wet last year in terms of the uh, starting position. Had to start three games last year, got thrown right into the fire. That was because of the nagging ankle injury that uh, Lufau would have from beginning all the way to the end of the year. Um, despite the fact that Montez barely threw for over 130 passes, still completed uh, nine touchdown passes. Does he do some of the same, same things that Lufau does in terms of uh, scrambling, in terms of mobility, absolutely. Not quite the same quarterback, but again, at least you got some experience uh, with him. Buffaloes were a middle of the pack team in terms of total offense as far as you know, Pac-12 standards go. 31 points per game, and they uh, averaged 437 yards of total O per contest. Again, that's about middle of the pack. That number, no question, would have been increased if the Pass blocking had been better. They were not very good in this area. And the run blocking, I thought, was okay. So, again, it's going to start with that running attack. But for the Buffalo offensive line, pass protection, it's got to be better because the opposition got to the quarterback too many times, either through sacks or through quarterback hurries. All right, let's chit-chat about the defense. And one heck of a job Jim Levitt did last year as defensive coordinator. Buffalo's had one of the best defenses in all of college football. Uh, number two in the Pac-12. As far as overall defense, only giving up 342 yards per game. Also, number three in the conference in points allowed. Only 21 points per game they sacrifice. But there's bad news, and then there's bad news for CU. First the bad, Jim Levitt, now defensive coordinator at Oregon. Okay, So now taking over will be DJ Elliott, who has his work cut out for him. Now here is the bad news. you got to replace eight starters on the defensive side. And that includes all three of the down linemen. So to say that Colorado will digress a bit is going to be an understatement. But let's talk about the linebackers, where they do have some experience back. Ricky Gamboa, he's been uh, Mr. Reliable for them in terms of tackles. He's the leading returning tackler for the Buffaloes. 77 stops is what he had a year ago. He's made 25 consecutive starts. Covers the field very well. Um, Ryan Moeller played some a year ago. He'll, you know, he, he could play the safety position. 
He can play linebacker, but right now the guy wound up what they call the buff position. So you have Moeller back, a senior. And hoping to make a recovery after last year's unfortunate ACL early in 2016, Derek McCartney, who will play outside linebacker. Secondary, boy, were they money last year. They were big time, and that's reflected by the NFL draft because Buffaloes had three secondary players pick second, third, and fourth round in this past year's NFL draft, okay? And by the way, they had a defensive lineman picked in the seventh round. Three other players trying out for the NFL as free agents from that Buffalo defense. So you got seven players from last year's Buffalo defense that either got drafted or trying out via the free agent route in the NFL. So, yeah, a tall order, no question, for uh, Mr. Elliott trying to get that defense to maintain their excellence in terms of what they did last year, hoping it transfers to this year. Um, the lone full-time starter you had back, though, um, he's a good one. Talking about Afalabi Laguda, um, who can play any you know defensive position as far as that back seven goes. Uh, they can put him at a nickelback or at a corner, but he's uh, listed as strong safety where he'll see the majority of action. And the corner, who wasn't a full-time starter, but did see some quality PT, that is Isaiah Oliver. Oliver, by the way, you might remember Stanford fans. I hate to remind you of that, but he was the one that had that uh, interception when the Cardinal were driving on that final drive. And um, Oliver's interception sealed the deal in uh, uh, the Colorado win 10-5. to So uh, you have some experience back uh, with Oliver, who now will be a full-time starter. So, again, Buffaloes have to be able to overcome those massive uh, losses on the defensive side in terms of their talent from a year ago. Special teams, boy, this was definitely Rocky and Boulder. Get it? Rocky, Boulder? <laughs> okay, okay, bad humor. But let's go ahead and move on. Um, special teams, yeah, it wasn't a venture to say the least. It didn't matter if they used Chris Graham or if they used David Price. Um, the kicking last year uh, wasn't very consistent. Nine missed field goals and extra points weren't to give me either. As a matter of fact, they used as many as four place kickers last season. So that starting job this year is definitely up for grabs. And don't be surprised if James Stefanu gets the job. Probably never heard of the guy from Australia. 30-year-old freshman. So he could end up winning the job as well. One position that does look solidified, even though it could improve, is punting Alex Kinney. Um, He's the projected starter for the third straight year, averaged 41 yards per boot last season. Breaking down the Buffalo schedule, the opener could be tricky. Colorado State's one of the better teams in the Mountain West, even though I know the Buffaloes destroyed the Rams last year. CSU is going to be much better this time around, and Colorado State will have already played a game the week before, whereas this is Colorado's first, so advantage could go to CSU in this one. Pac-12 opener for Colorado at home against Washington, a rematch of last year's Pac-12 title game in which the Huskies destroyed the Buffs. Same thing could happen this year. Washington's on a much higher level. The game at UCLA, it's winnable. You know, the Bruins were one of the bigger disappointments last year in college football, but the game is at the Rose Bowl, and the Buffs have to face Josh Rosen, a very talented quarterback for the Bruins. And then take a look at the rest of the schedule. The game at Washington State, I think, is going to be pretty tough. Mike Leach's offenses usually are very lethal, and they return their starting quarterback. The final two games, you get USC. I see the Buffs being massive underdogs in that one. And then you wrap up the year at Utah, and just like Colorado, the Utes have a lot of defensive talent to replace. The Vegas projection as far as win total for Colorado this year, 7.5. Do I think that's too high or too low? I think it's too high. I don't think Colorado is going to exceed the 7.5 win plateau. In fact, I've got Colorado winning six games, which would keep them at bowl eligibility for the second straight year. But it is going to be a drop-off, even though I know the offense will put up a lot of points, and I think it will be another good year for Phillip Lindsay. The defense has way too many questions to answer. Gamboa is one heck of an inside linebacker, but not enough experience to help around him. And plus, there are enough landmines on that schedule to prevent the Buffs from getting anywhere even close to the 10-win plateau that they reached in 2016. Do I think that Colorado will make it to a bowl game? Absolutely. Do I think that they will contend for the Pac-12 South Championship? Not this season. That's my look at the Buffaloes. Catch you later.